Yep, jolly good. Okay, well, thank you for coming to this webinar, and um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Somebody said I look tired, but that's because I slept well last night. The better you sleep, uh, the more tired you become. So we're going to look at boosting students' confidence to communicate um, in English, obviously, today. And I want to start just by showing you, this is what I looked like before I started teaching. I was full of hope and happiness. You can see what a career in um, ELT has done to me. These are some of the, oh, hang on. Oh, shit. Ah, okay. Hip, hello. These are some of the places that um, I've taught in. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, do you recognize this flag? Do you know that country? Italy. Uh, I was there for um, six months. 1988 I started. Italy was my first job. Um, Spain. Portugal, this flag, Hong Kong. I was there with the British Council um, in the early uh, 90s. Uh, Japan, was there for three years in the late 90s. This small country on the edge of Europe, a bit cold and rainy. Uh, I spent some time there as well. Um, I've taught lots of uh, different classes from different um, uh, places, um, you know, like universities and um, language schools and so on. Um, what I'm saying is I've got a broad experience. In 2000, um, I started writing um, textbooks um, full-time. Uh, reading Keys, I don't know if you know from Macmillan. Um, that's one of my favorites, actually, because a good reading course can, you can really get some, some nice content there. And also, um, it's good. I think reading is the best way that you can improve your language. If you can do nothing else, then read, 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 read. Uh, Get Real, some of you may re recognize. That was Macmillan's first Asia-specific um, course. Uh, it came out in late 90s, I think, and Breakthrough Plus. Uh, for Cambridge, I've done a few other things, like um, Cambridge English Skills, reading, uh, what else, uh, CD-ROM for English Grammar in Use. Quizzes, questionnaires, and puzzles, things like that. Q for OUP. Anyway, my writing always starts with the classroom, and I always start with the students, and I always think, you know, not every student um, comes to us full of confidence. And that's what we're going to look at today, um, confidence. Now, confidence is the key to successful language learning I'm absolutely sure it gives you motivation it gives you a sense of achievement a positive mindset if you're a confident learner you are a successful learner no doubt about it um, the problem though is that confidence is the biggest challenge for many of our students um, and it's the biggest thing holding them back in many cases a uh, number of times I've had somebody say I'm sorry I don't speak English imperfect English is a sign that they're not confident in speaking English uh, or communicating in English. It's a problem especially perhaps for students in Asia, perhaps because of the educational history. Um, they're not used to um, sort of, you know, coming forward in that way. But I think it's a problem for people all over, you know, students all over. Uh, just being confident in speaking another language, it's not easy. Uh, I know I'm not confident when I try and speak other uh, languages, and I'm rubbish. So um, I think it's important to uh, see it from the student's perspective. We can't blame them for lacking confidence. <clears throat> we have to help them. So especially it's a problem for students in Asia, I think, in my experience, but also students all around the world. We need a boost. We need to give them a boost. The first thing is, why do students lack confidence? Now. You've probably got a lot of ideas of your own. Here are a few of mine. Number one, they're not familiar with the communicative approach, the whole thing about getting into pairs and having a chat and exchanging ideas and so on. Um, they're not used to it. Um, they're not used to asking questions to the teacher and so on. Um, they're going to be um, holding back for that reason. We're asking them to do things they're not familiar with. Um, 
And partly because of that, they can't understand what to do. You know, speak to who, uh, do what, what do I fill in, how do I complete this exercise? They're not used to it. Um, and this is a big one. If they can't actually achieve it, you know, if they can't achieve the task that they're set, then um, that is an extremely demotivating thing for them. Um, they can't see the relevance sometimes. You know, okay, I, I can do it, but I don't see how this exercise will help me. Sometimes they may not be able to relate to the content. Um, it's just not interesting for them and it doesn't seem relevant to their lives. Uh, th a big one <clears throat> for intermediate students especially is a lack of progress. Um, they can come to class you know, month in, month out and they can fail to see any progress in themselves. There's a big plateau there at intermediate level and um, a lot of students can get bogged down in that and just lose confidence and think that they're not improving. Uh, this is a big one, I think. Uh, lots of students want attention from the teacher. That's why they come to the class. For you, the teacher, you know, me, 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 this is my problem. And in a large class, or even in a small class, you can't always give that kind of um, individual attention. Um, so they may not feel they get enough support from, you know, you, the teacher. And then we've all had students who think they are uh, better than everyone else in the class, even though perhaps they're not. And uh, equally, students who think it's all too difficult for them and they, they need to be in a different level. Uh, afraid of losing face if I say something and it's wrong, uh, you know, does that kind of reflect badly on me or what will people think? A lot of students prefer to keep quiet rather than um, have a go and risk making an error. So lots and lots of reasons why students lack confidence and I think it's important now that we have a look at how we can help them. Um, the, there's a link between confidence and motivation. I just want to point out, you've probably heard of all of these terms. Integral, um, that's where uh, you, know, you, there's, um, you want to be part of the culture. You, you, you know, love the United States or the United Kingdom. And you want to integrate yourself into that culture using the language as a vehicle. Instrumental is where, um, oh no, I have, to, um, I have to learn this language in order to you know, help my career, for example. There are two different and opposing types of motivation. These are also called sometimes intrinsic, meaning basically you just do it for fun. Um, and extrinsic, meaning um, no, uh, I need to uh, learn English in order to graduate or get a promotion or so on. And then you may have heard something called linguistic self-confidence, which is basically just a wish to interact in English. Uh, you know, we're living in a global world and um, lots of people out there want to feel equipped uh, in order to speak English with whoever. Um, most English is spoken between non-native speakers. So feeling confident of being able to interact in English um, is a, uh, you know, uh, a definite motivation uh, for many students. Basically, these are all ways of saying the same thing, though, um, and it comes to either whether you're motivated from within or whether from it's uh, whether it's uh, an outside motivation. Um, imposed motivation, in other words, instrumental extrinsic, is the route to failure. You know, if, if your motivation comes from outside, then you are more likely than not destined to lose confidence and motivation and interest in learning the language over time. So my question is, what is the biggest imposed motivation that English language learners and teachers face? What do you think that might be? What is the biggest imposed motivation that students face for them? Here we go, exams, 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 testing, testing, testing. Yes, it's no surprise, is it? Testing and assessment. And I think this is the huge problem that we're all facing. There's a massive drift in uh, language teaching towards basically just testing and assessing. I'm sure uh, most of you can sympathize with that. Um, I think it's bad for students, it's bad for teachers. Um, it's imposed on us both. Um, 
students start to panic. Is this in the test? Should we be doing this? Am I right? Can I say this? Accuracy becomes the most important thing for them. For teachers, you know, you might want to develop a theme. Um, you might want to work with your students in a different way, take things forward. But no, there's no time because we need to get on with the curriculum for the exam. Uh, it takes all of the fun out of teaching, really, and all of the fun out of uh, learning a language. Um, so this is my point, and this is what we have to deal with. The unrelenting trend towards testing and assessment is killing motivation, and with it, killing uh, confidence. Too much pressure. And thank you, I can see lots of people agree. Um, I was thinking about this, and I thought it's like driving a car. Um, imagine you have a car and you see it as a way to explore and see the world, go to places, connect. It's a, it's a good vehicle. But imagine you have to take a test every month. Then you look at the car in a different way. You don't see it as a way of exploring and seeing the world. All you see is having to get through the next test. Um, this picture is quite good actually because although he's trying to have fun, you can see by his eyes that he's actually uh, really nervous about something. And I think that's what, you know, testing and assessment has done to our students. They've, they've taken what's a fun activity that should give them confidence and uh, empower them to go out into the world and communicate. And the whole testing regime has just battered it down into a, you know, can I say this? Is this on the test? Am I right? It's a burden for us all. Um, and you remember some of you filled in a questionnaire at the, um, not at the beginning, but before, a couple of weeks ago maybe, about motivation. It's no surprise that tests and assessment were at the bottom of the factors motivating your students. I do equate motivation with confidence, yes, because I think um, if you're a confident learner, that is in itself a motivation. And if you have no motivation in order to communicate, then eventually you'll lose confidence. I do think there's a connection. So, we have to help our students through this and I think the way forward we can look at some key principles, key principles that may apply to um, all situations. The first one I'd like to say is that what we need to do is give students plenty of time to prepare and give them plenty of practice and then frequent review. And all of this needs to be underpinned by solid scaffolding. What I mean by scaffolding is whatever uh, support is needed in order to, for the students to achieve the task. So having a look here, scaffolding for speaking tasks, this is a scripted conversation. Now it's a clear model. Now, lots of you may be looking at this thinking, oh my God, what is this? I can't give that to my students. You see it as something sort of dead, just words printed on a page. But I'm trying to convince you in this first principle, that if we're looking at confidence, first of all, we have to take out the stress. Giving students a scripted dialogue showcases the target language in context and it's stress-free practice. They don't need to worry if they're right or if they're wrong. They can start to have fun, possibly for the first time in their language classroom. So, you know, it's an immediate pair, pair work task. They can listen, they can read, they can do it together with their partner. They're not worried. They can relax and have fun. Now here, you see what we've got is a scripted conversation with gaps. So they listen, they complete the gap, and then they repeat it. Look, they repeat it this time, once they complete it, they repeat it again. One, two, three. So they repeat this conversation four times. Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh no, this is terrible. All they're doing is parroting, parroting somebody else's words. What's the point of that? Um, and I thought the same when I um, first looked at language uh, textbooks um, and I saw this kind of conversation, I thought, no, that's rubbish. That's not speaking um, uh, as I would like my students to be speaking. But I didn't realize at that point that confidence was so low among a lot of the students I was um, teaching. And this kind of exercise 
takes the pressure, takes the weight off their shoulders and gives them a chance at least to speak in English without having to worry. So it's important that you see that this is a controlled stage and it's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. Okay? The end point is personalization and fluency, but by starting with a fully scripted conversation that showcases the language, the grammar and the vocabulary in a context that's useful, meaningful to the students that they can relate to, that's a good way to start to build back some of this confidence. It's controlled. It's not the end, it's the beans to the end. They go semi and then they go free practice and personalization afterwards. So if you see this kind of activity in a book, don't panic and say it's rubbish. See it as a confidence building exercise. And if your students lack confidence, then they might appreciate just a breath of fresh air with this kind of exercise from time to time. I also like this type of uh, scripted dialogue because you can pull out natural language in context. So things like, um, hey Kevin, can I have these CDs please? Hey there is um, getting attention. Uh, sure Joe, hey what's this? That's not getting attention, that's um, like hang on, wait a minute. You know, students like that kind of thing and um, you know, conversational fillers like anyway, well, and that's too bad, responding to news, no way, you're kidding, right? If you have a conversation, you can put these things in context and it makes them easier to, um, to explain to students. So looking at a scripted dialogue, you can pull these things out and start to have fun. I also think intonation, stress and rhythm is something that students really value. And you can uh, listen to the uh, dialogue, you can model the sentences, you can go through A and B uh, with the class. You know, left half of the class is Joe, right half of the class is Kevin. You can put them into pairs. Um, you can have real fun with the sentence stress and rhythm. Um, and then students start to feel, oh, actually, yeah, I can understand now how a native speaker would say this. You know, not can I, but can I, can I have the, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have? Can I have these CDs, please? You can have real fun with it. So I think that's part of confidence as well, because when students speak English, they want to know that they are speaking, you know, uh, in a natural way. They want to know that they're using um, the natural language. A lot of my students, well, some of them anyway, would think that swearing is um, an, a way to sound uh, sort of, um, you know, fluent. And I would have to take them to one side and say, no, it, it's not really good. Swearing is an art form. If you swear, you have to be really a native speaker. You can't get away with it otherwise. It just shows people that you are um, not, uh, that's not your L1. What they want to do to sound natural is to use all of these phrases here, like that's too bad, uh, no way, you're kidding, right? You know, to sound conversational fillers in idiomatic language. And they want to be able to talk um, you know, using the stress, intonation and rhythm. So that's what I mean about sounding natural, which gives confidence. I agree, swearing is a bad idea anyway in any language. Uh, but it irritates me intensely when students swear um, in English because they think they're cool and they're not cool, it's the exact opposite. That's my point. What they want is this kind of language. That's how they can relate more easily to native speakers, if that's their goal. So, scaffolding for speaking tasks, what I mean really is scripted dialogues here. I think they um, develop fluency, build confidence, uh, students can have fun, can sound natural, you can be creative, you know. Um, you can say, continue the conversation with your partner, you know, what happens next? Um, but, as I said at the beginning, they are a means to an end, not an end in themselves, and they must lead to personalization and fluency practice. They, you can't just give students a scripted dialogue and then do something else completely you know, different. Useful and fun, but it needs to lead somewhere. Um, it doesn't have to be a scripted dialogue. Uh, I use mind maps a lot with my classes. Um, I don't know if you do. I like them a lot find them very easy to um, explain to students. I just demonstrate once and immediately they've got the idea. Um, in this case, you know, a student writes the name in the middle and then has a um, mind map. The thing about a mind map is 
no sentences, just maybe three words maximum, symbols, colors, pictures, um, you know, abbreviations, um, you know, she remembers the fireworks festival in Cherry Blossom, uh, very beautiful uh, in spring, sitting underneath the cherry blossom trees. You know, this kind of thing is a good way, again, to prepare students. Sorry that's gone over, but this is a preparation activity. I would set this um, as a homework for the next class, and then when students arrive, they have their mind map on whatever the topic is ready to uh, start them off. The point is they're prepared. I think preparation is a big part of confidence. Uh, for writing tasks, um, of course you can give a model um, to say, look, here, here's a letter, um, do something like that. But I think you also have to supply a structure. A lot of students who lack confidence in writing it's because they don't really know the process, where to begin, you know, how to how to actually structure it. And as a teacher, you're left with 30 scripts or more, all of them. Basically, the English may be okay, but it's the organization that's the problem. So again, if we want to give students confidence in writing, let's show them what we want with a model, but let's also give them the structure. So in order to write about an experience you've had, step one, think of something that you've done when uh, a few adjectives, a few more details, and then repeat that for a couple more activities. Um, give them a structure. And again, it's back to personalization, confidence, motivation, and personalization. If you're not personalizing, if you're not talking about you know, your own experiences um, at the end of any activity, then something's wrong. Uh, you need to be writing and speaking. Productive skills need to be ultimately um, from the student's own experience. If it's not, they'll lose motivation. So, preparation, practice, and then review. The idea that, oh, we did, you know, the past simple two months ago. Obviously, as teachers, you know that's nonsense. You have to keep practicing, 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 and work it through, recycling. Um, students don't always get that, but they need it. And the more you do something, um, the more confident you get. And I think repetition is no bad thing in the language classroom. Uh, not repeating the same tasks, but repeating tasks that do the same things or achieve the same goals. Preparation, practice, review. I think those are the keys um, to helping students become more confident. This is something which we often forget as teachers. Um, the what, the how, and the why. Students must know uh, what they're going to do. And they, they need to know how to do it and why they're doing it. Now, for any activity, it's tempting to say, OK, go in, look, take this, you do this, you do that, off, go, begin. The problem with that is students don't necessarily always know what they're going to do. We haven't explained it well. And I know that in my teaching career, I've certainly made many errors by not explaining to students what uh, we're doing and not necessarily showing them how to do it either. Uh, and importantly, and this is the most important, uh, why? You know, this is fun, teacher, thank you, but why are we doing it? Um, the what, the how, and the why of any activity are absolutely um, critical, I think, for students to get them on board. Only then will they say, okay, yeah, let's do this thing. You know, if you want to get them motivated and excited, they have to know what it is, they have to know how to do it, and they have to know why they're doing it. Those are the basic precepts. And then, boom, they're on your side and you're off. Now, explain, show, practice, test. This is something, this is a principle I use when uh, dealing with skills and strategies. I like skills and strategies. I think language teaching, communicative language teaching, is all about skills and strategies, far more than tests. In fact, you can achieve a good result in any test if you have the skills and strategies. It should be, language teaching, in my view, should be about skills and strategies, not testing. Anyway, skills and strategies, I think it's absolutely vital to explain what the skill is. And then we need to show students how to do it. 
then we need to give them lots of practice. And finally, we test. Um, why do we test? Because that's what they expect. <laughs> I know. I know it's disappointing, isn't it? Um, but some students will only take something seriously if they feel there's a test. Now here, for example, let's say the skill is listening for main ideas. Um, you have to explain what that is, you know, explain what it is and give some tips on how to do it. Um, show, show students, um, you know, how it works. Here's a text. The main ideas could be pulled out from these points here. Um, and look, this is the answer for question one, and this is how we arrived at it, and this is the information here. Explain what the skill is, show them how to do it, and then practice, practice, practice. And finally, test, test, test. Identifying reference words, uh, you know, it's a useful reading skill. What do words like, uh, you know, it and they and so on uh, refer to? Explain what it is, show how it's done, cancer, this, this refers to cancer, mm, okay, explain, show, show them how to do it, you know, what to look for, give them practice, and then test, 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 not too much testing, by testing, I, the purpose of a test is to make sure that somebody has understood, um, you know, the procedures and the way to, to achieve that, um, the end, you know, the strategy or skill that they're practicing. So explain, show, practice, test. And I'm in two minds about testing because I don't like testing, but I do think that, you know, there's a place for it. As I said at the beginning, the problem is everything we do is revolving these days around, you know, these huge tests. By test here, I mean check, basically. You know, there, there, there's this purpose of this test is not to assess, but to just check that they've, um, they've understood the, the, the processes. Something else I want to point out as well with our students is um, if we want them to increase in confidence, then we can't jump in too high with things that are over their head. It's obvious, isn't it? And I know in a mixed ability class, it's not that easy. But the important thing, and even in a mixed ability class, uh, this can work, is to increase the challenge in stages. Now, I'll give you an example, um, looking at questions with how, for example, um, questions that begin with how, students have to listen to three um, possible responses and choose the correct one. So this is where the end point is down here, the test. Um, they have to listen, they have to a, a question, and then they choose the correct response, A, B, or C. What we don't do is jump straight in and just give them endless practice in that because practice does not make perfect. You know, there is a phrase in English, maybe you know it, practice makes perfect, but um, I don't think uh, it's true. I think you can do the same thing wrongly many times. I think you need to be shown or led um, uh, in the right direction. So, questions with how. First of all, we start with they can read the question and they can see a response. They match each question with a response. Then they can see the question and they have three possible responses, which they can also read. Here, they can read the question, but they have to listen to the three responses and choose the correct response. And then finally, this is the point, um, that they, they'll end at is, uh, you know, they'll hear the um, question and they choose the correct response. So you see, you can lead them in stages with, you know, slowly, gradually, from more easy to more difficult to get to the point where you need to be. So a mixed ability class, some students will drift through and think, fine, I like that, I feel more confident. Other students, the students that would have got lost if it was just straight practice, will at least have a sense of achievement up to that point. So increasing the challenge in stages and not jumping straight in is an important uh, thing in, uh, to bear in mind. 
don't forget the class dynamics. Now by class dynamics, I mean mixing up students. Students typically always sit in the same seats and um, you know it's comfortable because you know where they are. If you're like me, you never remember people's names, so it's important that they sit in the same place. However, mixing them up uh, is definitely a better a way to go. Don't let them sit in the same place all the time. Mix it up. It gives them confidence anyway, just in getting getting on with other members of the class. Um, when you mix them, you could put the weaker and the st stronger students together um, secretly to yourself, but you have to be careful with that because the stronger student may start to resent the fact that they're kind of doing your job by helping the weaker one. And equally, the weaker one may feel stigmatized or perhaps um, it may uh, they may lose confidence because this partner is so much better than they are. The idea of mixing weak and strong students is a good one, but you have to be careful about it. The idea of mixing students generally is always a good one, I think. Um, you know, in pair work, group work, every chance you have of mixing students and getting them to interact together means that they're not looking at you. And if they're not looking at you, you can go around the class and help students individually. And it's that individual attention, do you remember from the beginning, that students like. You know, they like to be spoken at by you, the teacher, to be given some individual help. Put students into pairs every single chance you get, and small groups of three or four, and while they're fulfilling the activity, go around and give some individual attention um, to students. Uh, I've been doing that routinely now for uh, a long time, and I know, I know it's, it's appreciated. Um, every chance you get. A way of splitting students is, uh, you know, you can choose any way. I choose A, B, C, D. So I start at the front row, I go A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Who's A? Hands up. You're over there. Who's B? Hands up. You're over there. So you can mix students, you know, in any number of ways. Now, the next one is, I know you're all going to relate to. Uh, error correction. We have students, um, depending on where you're teaching, <clears throat> some students may not feel comfortable to, unless they know it's a perfect sentence. They would rather not say anything than say something that was wrong. Other students have no problem and they will quite happily um, gabble away uh, to get their point across. Now as you know, teachers, we all know which of those is the best approach. However, um, my experience is, uh, you know, I'm often faced with, with people who worry, students who worry about mistakes. The point is mistakes are good because we learn from our mistakes. If you can get that across, then you're halfway there. Mistakes are good, we learn from our mistakes. There is a balance between accuracy and fluency. We can't just let students make mistakes all the time because then they'll, they'll think, oh, I don't know if I'm right or wrong and the teacher doesn't tell me, so I'm unhappy about that. You have to correct. The question is, when do you correct? When do you correct? Um, not during the activity, I would suggest. I would say that you correct afterwards, maybe in the next class or maybe a few classes down the line. What I do in a fluency um, activity, and I'm sure you do as well, is go around with a little um, pen and paper and just listen behind students as they're talking together. And if I hear any errors that I think are worth picking up, i.e. they're errors about the target um, language or maybe um, you know, vocabulary misused or whatever, I will make a note of that phrase and then Later on, I'll make a list of all of these phrases, sentences, and then I might photocopy them and give them out at the beginning of a class, especially when some students arrive late, just to uh, wait for them, if you like, but to give the students who are there a good reason for being there on time. And I will ask them to find the mistakes and correct them, and then you know check with their partner and so on. Uh, that way of dealing with errors shows you that in the fluency activities you are listening and you are picking up on their errors, but it doesn't mean that you were expected to correct them all the time. They won't expect you to do that, which is good, and it means that they can continue with their fluency activity without worrying too much because they know you'll pick up the important errors. 
Yeah, some people are writing they give error correction immediately after um, the task. I think that's good to start with. Um, you can say, okay, great, thank you, everyone sit down, did you enjoy that? Now, here are some of the errors that you made, can you find them? Um, you can do that immediately, the first time, why not? And then perhaps you don't need to do it after every class, you can hold, hold back and uh, you know, collate the most uh, relevant ones for another session. So it's the individual time that you give to students that will help them with their confidence as well. Um, you can f identify with each student what it is that they feel least confident about. Uh, oh, um, I don't feel I'm accurate when I'm talking or whatever it is. And you can give them some kind of reassurance, some kind of advice and tips um, to help them with that. Even give them individual homework by that, I mean, don't, don't ask them to write massive, uh, you know, uh, texts that will take you a long time, but tell them to go online and check out a couple of websites or listen to a, a, a podcast or something like that and uh, see how they get on. Give them some individual homework and individual time if you can, because that will definitely boost their confidence if they know they have you on their side. Um, in all of this, there's one point I want to finish with, which is the, the distinction between responsibility and support. You know, there is a, a relationship between how responsible the students should feel for their own learning and their own progress and how much support you should give them. And I always tell students, look, I can speak English okay. I'm not the one who needs the practice. It's your responsibility, right? Um, and I think that's important that they understand that ultimately it is down to them and it's not down to you. Yes, they want a bit of individual time from the teacher, but actually their success in uh, learning the language is ultimately dependent on them. And they need to understand that there is a relationship. You're there to support them in their learning, but they are the ones who are responsible for taking it forward. And when they feel that they've got that control, then they feel more confident in themselves. You know, you're giving them confidence then by emphasizing that they're responsible, you're empowering them, you're giving them confidence. Um, I also like the idea of choice. Um, I think it shows that you are a confident teacher if you say, look, next we can do A or we can do B. We can do this or we can do that. What would you like to do? That's another way of giving them some responsibility, you know, as a class, why not? Um, okay, let's do this, but give them a choice. Um, encourage them to take part in their own, you know, development in that way. And what happens in the class isn't simply all from you. They also have a say. So let's just review a confident student um, knows what's expected of them. By that I mean they know what to do, they know how to do it, they know why they're doing it, um, they're confident they have the tools that they need. Feels the practice is relevant to their needs. When, what they're doing they can relate to. They can think, okay, one day maybe I'll need this. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. I can see this practice as being relevant to my life. My life now or my life in the future. This is the most important one actually for me, even though I put it third. Um, it has a sense of achievement. I think every class we have, when the students leave, we have to make sure that they feel they've achieved something. Not that they've struggled through an exercise which they didn't understand and they couldn't do and they got a low result on. We need to make sure that when they leave, they leave with a sense of achievement. And as I said before, I think scaffolding helps and building things up and taking things, you know, increasing the challenge in stages, um, class dynamics, mixing them around, you know, making sure they know what to do. All of this goes towards this key point here a sense of achievement. They have to have a sense of achievement when they leave every class. And with that will come confidence.
Even if they're not confident at the beginning of the course, they will be by the end, if they have a history of successful achievement. Uh, yep, believes they're making progress. They have to see progress. They have to feel that they're making progress. Very hard at intermediate level. Um, some students like to agonize over the fact that they've been studying for months and months and they're no better. Um, when they finish explaining that to me, I tell them, well, look how well you've just explained your, uh, your difficulty there. You know, you couldn't do that three months ago. They have to believe they're making progress. Um, some can't be convinced, but most can. They have to feel supported. But remember what I said about responsibility as well. They have to feel responsible. They have to think that they are being appropriately challenged, so the exercises are at the right level for them. And uh, ultimately, as I said, they need to take responsibility for their own learning. Uh, they really do. And they need to understand that that's the key, not just for your class, but for their entire language learning um, you know, career ahead. So a quick, a quick review then. All of these principles are fine, and I'm sure you agree with them. I hope you do. I'm, I th I'm sure you've got some others of your own which you're uh, adding in the chat box, and I know John is um, and Becca, they're pulling these out. What we um, need to do now is to look at how this works in the classroom. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, -da, this is from uh, Breakthrough Plus. Now, don't panic. I'm not trying to um, sell you anything here, I promise. What I want to do is to show you how all of the principles that we've just looked at can come through in a, in a, a sequence of activities. Now, here at the beginning, you see this. Focus, that's what they're doing. Grammar, that's the grammar, and that's the vocabulary. So remember we said students need to know what they're doing yeah, and why um, right at the beginning. And I think right at the beginning you need to show them, okay, this is what this unit's about, this is what we're going to be looking at, this is the area, this is the grammar, and this is the vocabulary that we'll be practicing. And then they go, oh, okay, good. Without that, it's a mystery. But we need to set them up first by explaining what they're doing and why. So they have a little warm-up, um, looking at these pictures, and then they personalize, uh, which is important. Remember, personalizing, making it all about them, it is important. It doesn't have to wait until the end. You can slip it in at any point, of course. Uh, every chance you get, bring things back to students' personal experience. And then look at this conversation. Look how long that is, a scripted conversation. When I started teaching, I would immediately, I would close this book, I would throw it out, I would probably insist that nobody ever looked at it again, because that was the opposite of what I thought I should be doing as a language teacher. This kind of thing was a complete turn-off to me. I used to think there's no teaching involved in that, and there's no value to my students. And here I am, you know, spending years and years and years of my life now um, working on this principle. As I said, it's, it's a means to an end. It's a starting point. It's, a, it's an area where students can start to enjoy the language. They can relax. They can practice this without worrying, am I right, am I wrong? It showcases the grammar and the vocabulary in context. A big conversation gives you the room to do that. We remind students here what the, um, what, the, or what the grammar is. You remember they always want to be accurate, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we just shouldn't overemphasize it. If they're not confident, they can go to the back and check, do some exercises there. Then we've got the vocabulary, and then we've got the substitution drill. Look, one, two, three. Remember, three practices and the actual um, dialogue itself. This is a good five or even ten minutes in the classroom where you as a teacher can go around giving individual help and support to your students. I find this a breath of fresh air. You know, it's the weight of the class off your shoulders for five to ten minutes. In that time, you can think about lunch, you could write a note to your partner, or you could go and help your students with um, individual attention that they really, really um, need and deserve. 
in the meantime, they're practicing English, they're increasing their confidence, they're repeating. Remember, repetition, I think, is a good thing. They're repeating this three times. Three times. Each time they're getting better and more confident at it. So, we go from a model dialogue through some vocabulary essential. I put vocabulary, at, you know, number two. Reading, one. Vocabulary, two. In any language learning um, uh, attempt. And then uh, exchange, we've got the substitution drill. And then we've got semi-controlled practice uh, where they go to a, uh, the back of the book for an A-B activity. And then here, this is where they start to create the language themselves. I like it because it's visual and it means the language is coming out of their head. So they could start at any point. They could start with this picture or this picture or this picture or this picture and they pull the language out of their head. Again, we give them a model so that they know what's expected. And then we're encouraging them to take responsibility to create the language. They have the grammar, they have the vocabulary, and they can do it in their own way. Listening comprehension, <coughs> recycling the grammar and vocabulary, and then finally, ta -da, free practice and personalization. This is where it's all leading. And now they have a chance to um, talk about their own experiences and so on. The point is, they are not starting at this point, they are finishing at this point. When I started um, language teaching, I would go into the classroom and I would try and start at this point. And for some classes, it was great. They immediately you know, got to grips with it and they did really well. It was w wonderful practice. For 90% of classes, no, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because they didn't have the vocabulary, they weren't confident of the grammar, they hadn't really thought about the, um, the situation and ideas and so on. What we've got here is a process that gets around that. It ends at the same point, but it gives them a lot more help before they get there. So I just want to show you that. Remember, this is a completely closed, scripted conversation. However, you can have great fun with it and students can really boost their confidence here. We then give them the vocab. We then repeat, repeat, repeat to boost their confidence. Yeah, And then they start pulling the language out of their heads here. A little bit of real world, this is what it's like elsewhere. And then they personalize. So personalizing is the end point. And that's how uh, we get there. See the challenge feature, if you have a mixed ability class, which of course we all have, then those students who finish first, my nightmare, you know, teacher finished, and you think, oh, okay, we've got two teachers, uh, two students who finished, and the rest of the class haven't. What do I do? Instead of telling them just to shut up and wait, um, you can give them a challenge, which is a, a, an extension, a little booster activity that will uh, keep them occupied for a while. Again, it's all about confidence and motivation. Um, and remember what I said about responsibility, giving them a choice. <clears throat> That's why at the end of Breakthrough Plus, every unit, we have an expansion section which has listening, vocabulary, reading, and writing. And you can give students the choice. Okay, who wants reading? Or if your class all want to do another speaking activity, you know, go ahead with that from the teacher's guide. But if they want vocab, okay, you guys do vocab. You guys do the reading. You know, give them a hand in um, selecting what they want to do. Give them that opportunity. That's why I put it in there at the end of every unit because I think choice is good. Um, it frees things up. It makes them feel they've got a say in what they're doing. You could do the whole lot, of course, or you could just do one or two. It's up to you. Uh, it's whatever they need and want. So that's it from me. Um, I know we've got a few questions. Uh, I think John and Becca will um, hopefully uh, feed in with those. But I hope you um, agree with some of those points, and I'll look forward to um, seeing all of your own as well. Thank you. Great. Hi. Thanks so much, Miles. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Great. Yeah, I've got some questions from uh, from some of the guys uh, today. So I'll, I'll fire away with the, the first one. The first one comes from Sovinda, who's in Cambodia. And he's talking, when you're talking about the imposed motivation, he was wondering if unit tests 
are a good idea, or is this like more sort of imposed motivation? And any ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, it is a balance, isn't it? Um, a test is basically a stick to a student. It's not a carrot. And I think there's a place for using it, but it depends how big the stick is, you know. If it's a test which is a unit test, um, then students can understand they're just making sure they're reviewing, they're revising, they're uh, checking their knowledge of what they have just done. I think that's fine. And if there are no negative consequences, then I think, you know, why not? I think it's a good way to review. A test can be seen as a review. The kind of testing I loathe is the external testing where they wonder, am I B1, am I B2, what's my TOEIC score, is it 775 or 795, you know. That kind of test, um, external test, is something that I think is killing language learning. But I think within language learning, ourselves as teachers, we do need to review and we do need to test what we've done. It's a different, it, the same word, different kind of function. Great, thank you, thank you, Miles. Uh, next question. Actually, a few a few participants uh, ask questions around the the why. So when you were talking about tasks and explaining um, uh, the why part, yeah, how do we explain the why and why do we explain the why? There was a few questions around that. <laughs> well, I'll start with the, uh, the why. The why. Why explain why? It's because whatever people do, and think about it from our own point of view, if somebody asks you to do something, then you want to know why. You know, if I ask somebody to take this, um, you know, cup into the room over there, um, they might say, well, why? You know, why, <laughs> why can't you do it yourself? But we all need to know why we're doing things, otherwise we have no um, purpose, no goal. You have to set the goal, we know what to do. But we need to know why. So in terms of language uh, activity, how do you explain why? OK, well, let's imagine it's a speaking activity and um, we're setting it up. We explain what it is. Now, the what is often the why, and it should be, because we need to be giving students something that is practical and useful and relevant in their real lives. So we've answered the question right there. If in explaining what to do and setting the context, you know, you, you can then say, look, we're doing this because at some point you will be in a supermarket, you know, needing to speak English and perhaps the price will have gone through the, uh, the till wrong or whatever. Or you may be lost in a street somewhere and you may need to ask directions. You know, the why is often in the what, uh, because what we're asking students to do has to be relevant to their real lives and why they're doing it is because it's relevant to their real lives. So it's a, it's a kind of nice little circle. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Vietnam, uh, Han Ngoc uh, Vu. Uh, what will we do with the weaker students who don't want to talk in group activities because they don't have enough vocabulary? Mm. Well, I think the key there is to make sure they do have enough vocabulary. And so, like I was saying with the scaffolding, with the support, Think about what you want the students to do, but make sure beforehand they have the language they need. So they must have the grammar and the vocabulary they need. That's what Breakthrough Plus is all about. It's all about making sure the students have the grammar, they have the vocabulary, they've practiced it, they've seen it in context, they've heard it, and now they use it. So the problem that um, that's raised there is a problem of scaffolding. They must have the vocabulary. We can't ask students to do things that they don't have the vocabulary for. I agree completely. Uh, you can't ask students to talk about a topic when so many keywords they need are not known to them. That's our responsibility as teachers, to make sure that what we ask students to do, they can actually fulfill. Thank you, Miles. Um, I think the final question here we have from Xavier. Um, he asked, do you think that regular testing with numerical scores can help create a concrete indicator for students that they are making progress? 
Yeah, I, I would say absolutely not. I think it's meaningless. Um, equally, a, a, you know, whether it's 775 or 550, or whether it's a B1 or a C2, or, or whatever it is, I think that is a meaningless, meaningless way of assessing your uh, ability and progress. Unfortunately, we're faced with a world where language testing is such big business. Uh, you know, that's where all the publishers uh, are going, and that's what they're hammering down institutions' throats, and that's what we as teachers all have to end up teaching for. And therefore, we do end up talking about, you know, is this person an A1 or a B2 or God knows what. Um, it's not right, and it doesn't help. A good friend of mine has started learning Spanish. He started learning two years ago. His Spanish is now much better than mine. And for the first time a week ago, he said, oh, I wonder if I'm, I'm a B2. You know, and I thought, oh, God, you know, even, even somebody who doesn't have a history of growing up learning a language, he's in his 50s, um, starts to worry about these meaningless things. And um, I think it's a shame. Uh, it's impossible to avoid, but, you know, However many times you tell a student, it's not about, you know, numbers and letters. It's about what you can do, how well you can do it. It's about feeling confident when you interact in English. It's about all of these things. Nope, it comes down to whether my TOEIC score is 550 or 650 or whether I'm a, a, a C2, uh, you know, or a C1 or whatever. Um, there's no way around it. I'm sorry. It's just that we have to deal with it. That's the problem. And that's, that's what I've been looking at here. Great. And final one, another one from Vietnam, from Nguyen, Nguyen Bui. Do you think using games in the classroom is a good way to boost students' confidence? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, immediately I'm thinking of students who have come to me in the past and, and thought, yeah, it's fun, but all we're doing is playing games. You know, all we're doing is playing games. And this is down to explaining why we're doing things. Uh, back to one of your earlier questions. If students think that, okay, it's fun, but you know, it's just a game, they may not take it seriously. They may lose confidence or motivation. You know, they may not be confident that coming to the class has a purpose or a value. If you can explain the function of the game and say, look, it's fun, and because it's fun, it doesn't mean it's meaningless. Actually, this is what you're doing. This is how you're learning. You're improving your speaking and listening skills in this way, or you're using this language. You know, explain that the game has a learning objective, and I think you'll always be okay. If you just give endless games, however valid they are from a language teaching perspective, if the students don't realize that they're learning, if they think they're just playing games, then you need to be careful because they might just drift off and think, oh yeah, nice class, but all we do is play games. I hate that phrase, all we do is play games, because in fact, it's exactly the way we should be learning a language. Um, it's about how we explain the purpose of what we're doing to the students. That's important. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miles. Um, thank you for today's uh, session. I think everyone uh, out there will, will join me in saying um, a big thanks um, for waking up early and coming on and delivering uh, such an informative session today. So yeah, thanks again um, for your uh, for your session. You're welcome, and thank you everybody uh, for um, turning up. And please feel free to email me with any questions. John, please give me uh, give my email out if you like. I can put it down here now. Um, I'd love to hear from you and carry on this conversation uh, if you want. Miles Craven at yahoo.com. Thanks, guys. I'm going to press on. It's been great, and I really appreciate you coming. Cheers. Bye. Great. Thanks, Miles. Um, and for those who are still with us, um, for your certificate, please uh, email us at asia education at macmillan.com. Uh, Likewise, um, for more tips um, for yeah, boosting up your students' confidence when communicating, do check out our new ELT Upgraders uh, podcast. Uh, you can scan the QR code there on the, sli on the slide, and there'll be some more uh, useful tips for you um, for boosting up 
your students' confidence uh, when communicating. So thanks again for all of you for uh, attending uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next ELT Upgraders webinar. So thank you so much.